uh, the opera, the Dorothy Chan. And get a little drink. Get a sprite? No, I'm fine. Oh. Something else for you? Thank you so much. Go ahead. Okay, go, go. <laughs> go, go, go. Maybe he'll be here. After the show, we'll have to go out there by the other building where the Amundsen, because that's where we went before. Remember?
both at the podium, this podium, and at the other podium. It's going to be a terrific opera, so we're really glad you're here. I would like to share with you today some of the functions that we in the Opera League do and want to encourage you to become a member. In support of our members, we offer seminars and host local gatherings and music salons. We provide a sneak preview at the beginning of the new season and offer ways to help our volunteers go behind the scenes and see what really happens in putting an opera together. We have more than 80 activities a year as members of the Opera League. Some of it is work, a lot of it is play, and it's all fun. One of the things that we do, well actually everything that we do, next to the last rehearsal, is put together a very large potluck that is almost all homemade food. Some of it is you know, from Costco, but most of it's homemade. <laughs> and both Maestro Domingo, last year we gave, I think, $75,000. Um, that's a big deal. And it helps them run programs that introduce young people to opera and bring them here for rehearsals. It's just a wonderful thing. And we love to support that operation. So, during intermission or on your way out, you must need to buy a gift for someone from here. We have a terrific cookbook that has recipes from different opera stars and people that you would know, and that's on sale. I mean, really on sale. So, it's a great thing to take to a dinner party instead of a box of candy or a bottle of wine. Which is Lady Macbeth of Midsen at the Metropolitan Opera. He's conducting, uh, his conducting was described by the New York Times as inspired, incisive, and colorful. And the production was included in the New York Classical Review's Top 10 Performances of 2014. Opera News characterized it as a performance that must rank high among the company's triumphs of the last 40 years. He also conducted the National Orchestra's uh, Orchestra of Spain in Madrid, the National Symphony Orchestra of the Rye in Torino, and the New World Symphony in Miami. Before returning to LA to rehearse the Ghosts of Versailles, the Barber of Seville, and the Marriage of Figaro as part of our Figaro tri trilogy. Maestro Conlon's going to be with you in a moment. I thank you for your attention. And I know that you're going to enjoy this performance. Thank you.
the, the website. Don't read that when you're going to bed because I understand from all the scientists now that those screens make you stay awake all night. So um, that's for your reading pleasure. Today, of course, I brought my. Um, I don't know what I forgot my iPod today. Or I think my, my office is just a, way, a little ways down. Hang on. <laughs> what was it to figure out? I'm not sticking. She should go. <laughs> now, just go in the direction of the restrooms to the bar, and then you'll see a door going backstage, which is just open. This is the only theater where you can actually get in from the outside, but we need a key to get out. That's why you should not go backstage. <laughs> Unless you want to stay there. You should see some of these on your seats. And on, this is a, a, a family tree of the Barber Seville and the Mary Figaro. We'll take that home and, and enjoy it. Uh, and I brought you uh, some family trees up here. They're a little hard to see, but you'll be able to follow them um, along there. Turn it over. This is the marriage figure. Uh, to start with, uh, the reason I ask you if there's some people seeing it for the first time is that this opera has a very special meaning to me, and I'll tell you a little personal story, um, which is irrelevant to the rest of what I'm going to say, but it's just sort of meaningful to me. Um, the Barber's Hill was the second opera I saw. I was 11 years old, and it was the opera that made me fall in love with, or make, actually made me realize that I was in love with classical music. And consequently, I asked for piano lessons because I wanted to learn to play the Barber's Seville at, at the piano. I did not have any ambitions uh, to play Rachmaninoff piano or cherry. didn't even know what they were. I wanted to play the Barber's Seville piano. Uh, but, by the way, I still can't. It's very difficult. It's very difficult. Um, but one thing led to another, but the Barber of Seville is the, um, is, was probably the, uh, the moment that everything in my mind exploded and I fell in love and I've never fallen out of love. Of course, it led on to Beethoven and Brahms. And, and um, in fact, the, in the um, summer, I'm going to tell you my age now, you know it anyway, 1962, summer 1962, um, I had a wonderful, wonderful piano teacher whose name was Dorothy Mesny, and uh, it was just school had just ended and I was, uh, uh, for various reasons, uh, sort of moaning and groaning about the summer, and she said, what do you want to do? She gave me some hot chocolate and said, I was so sad. And she said, what do you want to do? I said, I want to be in an opera. She said, well, that's a wonderful idea. Now, somebody said, well, that's a stupid idea. Go play tennis, that would have been the end of it. But she, because she was such a wonderful, creative person. She said, well, that's a great idea. How would you do that? And I said, well, you know, I have some costumes in the attic. And she said, well, who's going to be in Oh, I said, I'll browbeat my friends. And I did. And we made this little cast, and we, and we had the list of two performances. So I said, she said, where are you going to perform it? I said, I don't know. She said, well, why don't you use my garage? <laughs> I said, it's a great idea. So we used the garage. We put people out in the, in the uh, there are pictures to prove this. I'm not picking them out. <laughs> uh, we used the driveway, and we, we earned, we uh, rose, to, uh, we raised $75 for a local ambulance court. Um, and I'm thrilled to see uh, Jonathan Mesby's two daughters sitting right back there. Would you stand up and take a bow to you right there? There they are. There they are. As part of the family, you might notice his uh, childhood. Three, 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 okay, that's not the end of my story. So, okay, I'm going to conduct the Barbers to Bill more than anything else. I decided I'm going to be a conductor. And in 1973, I'm now 23 years old. My for one of my first gigs, Washington Opera, I get to talk to Barbara Seville, seven performances in five days, one cast in English, one cast in Italian. The Rosina and the Italian cast was the young and yet not very well known Flick of Alstabe. And then the English cast the, uh, was the young and not very well known Maria Ewing. And there we all were, I played the rest of the teams at the harpsichord, happy as a clam. And I said, oh, this is great, I'm going to be able to conduct this for the rest of my life. And guess what? I never conducted it again until last week. <laughs> so 40 years later, I'm reunited with the work wow. that made me love classical music, and I'm having a great time, and I hope that if you're seeing it for the first time, that something similar will happen to you. Now, you know we are in the midst, uh, in the midst of uh, something called Figaro Unbound. Uh, it's sort of an idea that Figaro, the character, is a the dynamic energy. You might all feel about that. But uh, he is, was uh, probably the leading uh, playwright of, in uh, 18th century France. Uh, 
Um, and he did it all with these three plays. In fact, he did it in two plays, The Barber Seville and The Marriage of Figaro. Uh, there are three operas, there are more than three operas. The Girls of Versailles is based on the third of those stories, which is The Guilty Mother. You don't need to worry about that now. Um, we're at the beginning of the story today, The Barber Seville, and three characters are introduced to her. So we're going to go through those three operas. But the most important thing to realize is that the character of Figaro is actually the character of the author Omar Shea. And that starts with, where does that name come from? It's a very famous name, and it exists until this day as one of the leading newspapers of France. Uh, and uh, the, the name Figaro is derived from Fils Caron. His name was, his real name, Beaumarchais' real name was, uh, uh, was Caron, his father was Caron. He was born Caron. Uh, Pierre Augustin Caron. Now, if you want to convince the king of France to take up arms with the young revolutionary army, um, he took that took a long time for him to do that. We all know about La, uh, we all heard of Lafayette, but the fact is that Beaumarchais was the first one. He pushed for it, and he personally, at his own expense, shipped several thousand arms to the American Revolutionary and gave them to the American Revolutionary, and they won the Battle of Saratoga basically with those weapons. He was given no credit, thank you so much. Uh, he was given no credit, he was never repaid. And in fact, um, until the 1880s, he wasn't even known about. Now to my uh, astonishment, last week after I gave my own speech, the next day I met somebody, uh, maybe it was even the evening, came to me and said, do you know that if you go online and you put in Beaumarchais CIA, you will find an enormous article. Well, I found it, and it's about eight or nine pages long. The information about Beaumarchais's involvement in the American Revolution was declassified in the 1990s. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Who'd have thought? Oh my gosh. Uh, so, there's a lot of fascinating reading about him, and at least what the CIA perceived about Beaumarchais. <laughs> Okay, so we've got a trilogy of plays. The Barber Seville is written by Beaumarchais, the premier in the Comédie Française, in the Comédie Française, 1775. Okay. Within several years, an opera is written, not by Rossini, but by Giovanni Paisiello, who was one of the leading composers of Italy at the time, Naples, he was, he was a master, and this is his masterpiece. It was premiered in St. Petersburg uh, in 1782, so that's seven years, eight years after the composition became a great opera, and it held the stage for many decades. Uh, Mozart, uh, on the way back from St. Petersburg, which took about four months, uh, Paisiello met the young Mozart. The young Mozart saw that score, and there's no question that it had an influence on the marriage of Figaro. The Paisiello Marcel is very much worth hearing, and we're going to produce it very shortly. Just watch for the, watch for the announcement on, in, uh, in April with the young artists here. You know, this will be your chance to see the Paisiello Marcel. I fell in love with it several years afterwards, after uh, hearing the, the, the Rossini, because I loved anything that had to do with the Barber Seville. So, 1782. Now, then, uh, second, the Marriage of Figaro, written in Paris, premiered finally in 1784. Two years later, Mozart writes The Marriage of Figaro, uh, which is the sequel. So, the Paisiello Barber Seville is an important work and remains so. Paisiello's followers were incensed when a young upstart com composer, Rossini, dared to use the same subject as the Barber Seville. Now he changed the uh, he changed the title, he called it Alba Viva, that's the leading tenor, Count Alba Viva, and the useless precaution. You'll be hearing about the useless precaution a lot tonight because it's referred to it. It is the subtitle of the Barber Seville. That was in order not to offend Paisiello. Paisiello was rather confident because he was an old master, said, well this young guy can't write anything. I'll let him do it. So he says, yeah, go ahead, write the opera. Meanwhile, his followers come to the premiere and they boo and hiss so much that the curtain had to be brought down in fact, too. In other words, it was a fiasco. Um, so they all went home content with themselves and thought that was the end of it. But the next night, of course, was the second performance. It was a stunning triumph. And within no time, the opera, the, the Barbara Seville Rossini conquered the operatic world and has never left the repertory anywhere since 1816. Paisiello home and not, on, and not happy about this, uh, was so deeply angry and depressed that he died four months later. <laughs> now, that, that's not funny exactly, but you know, Paisiello was, in other words, surpassed. But the opera is worth hearing, 
and you should hear it. Now, so we've got these two omens. We have three characters who are going to make their way all through the trilogy. This is Beaumarchais' Barbara Seville, and this is Rossini's, and they are virtually identical as to the cast. Um, there is Rosina, she is a young, beautiful soprano, or actually mezzo-soprano, she is um, ready for love, and she is captured, as it were, because her an old man named Dr. Bartolo uh, is her, uh, is her, uh, is her guardian. Why she, that is, that's not clearly explained. She was probably a girl from a wealthy family and um, maybe didn't know her parents, but she has a dowry, and that's important. And Dr. Bartolo wants the dowry, but he also wants to marry her. He is an unsuitable uh, partner, I would say, for a beautiful young girl, maybe 18 years old. He's old, he's grumpy, he's ugly. Um, uh, what else can I say about him? He's pompous. He's nasty, uh, but we sort of love him anyway because you know those sort of people that complain all the time. They're they're, they're pretty amusing on the stage, if not off. So that's the story. He wants to marry her, and the young Count of Alviva has seen her and fallen in love with her, and has followed her to her house in Seville. And is to be we're going to discover him trying to sell in spiritual, intellectual way because what he was saying, and you'll see it a little bit in this opera and a lot in the Marriage of Figaro, is that the servant class. Is, uh, is are the people, they are the salt of the earth. They're the ones who do the work. They're the ones who maintain society, while the aristocrats, um, as, uh, as the Figaro's will say to the count in the play, said, why are you so great? Because you took the trouble to be born into a wealthy family. <laughs> and uh, the count will complain at one point, you know, the servants in this house take longer to dress than the, than the aristocrats. And Figaro says, yes, that's because they don't have servants to dress them. <laughs> so this party will is a basic part of the, the revolutionary aspect of Figaro. We're going to see it in a very amusing way because, of course, the Count and Figaro are not at odds with each other, at least yet. In this opera, they are allies, but we're going to see that Figaro is the one with the brains, the energy, the inventiveness, and all that it takes to help the determined young man take the girl away from the determined old man. So we've got Dr. Bartolo, we have Rosina, and we have the Count, and there they are. They will, of course, marry, and she will become the Countess, and we'll see her again in the marriage of Figaro. We will see her over here now as the Countess. Now, um, you don't need to know too much about the rest of them, except for Don Basilio. Um, he's, he's a sort of, uh, He's the sort of fellow that is based on everybody sleazy you have ever known. <laughs> Beaumarchais yeah. actually based him on uh, a loyal servants. One was called La Jeunesse, that's youthful, and the other one's called uh, uh, Le Veille, who is wakeful. One of them is sleeping all the time because he's, uh, Pippi Grove has given him sleeping pills, and the other one is sneezing all the time because he has given her something to sneeze by. Now, she, they both become Berta, and they, so you will see her in the, in the house. You'll see uh, Fiorello, a servant of the Count of Viva at the beginning, and then he disappears for the rest of the opera. So now you know that Rossini belongs to the period that is called Bel Canto. We've talked a lot about this in the past. We've, we've done La Cegarentula, Cinderella, we've done the Turk in Italy. Um, we've talked about Bel Canto, it means beautiful singing, bell coming from Bello or Bella, B. L, canto meaning song, beautiful song, beautiful singing. It is the art form that dominated the Italian opera from, the, well, let's say, 1800 to about 1850. The three major proponents that we know are Rossini, who was the seminal figure, Donizetti, you'll remember Donizetti from Lucia di Lammermoor, from the Elders of Love, and Bellini, you'll get a chance to hear Norma next year. The concepts of bel canto are exactly what they say. You go to the opera to hear beautiful singing. And there was a very, almost a strict rule, a strict, I would say, school of what does bel canto mean? What does it mean to sing beautifully? Number one, you have to have a beautiful voice. You think that's obvious. I mean, I may know the technique of bel canto and can actually demonstrate it. I'm not going to do that today. <laughs> because my voice is so ugly and useless that I can't sing bel canto by definition. So you have to have a beautiful voice. You have to show that you have very good breath control, that you can sing very long lines without taking a breath and singing them in a very smooth and mellifluous way. That's one thing. You also have to show that you can sing fast. And those two basic concepts 
are already demonstrated in almost every piece of music. The aria, which is a song for one person, sometimes a duet as well, because it's going to start with a slow part where you're going to show how you can sustain your breath and have a beautiful sound, and it's going to have a fast part, which is going to show how you can sing quickly and sing high notes. And it's always going to end with the fast and high notes, and it's supposed to impress you, and you are supposed to applaud when it's over. Uh -huh. so we're expecting uh, your participation this afternoon. <laughs> now, if we're doing Parsifal, or I don't know, Pelias and Melisande, we discourage you from applauding in the middle of an act. But these operas, the Rossini operas, the Bel Canto operas, are written for audience participation, and that's why they are, uh, are written with a rousing ending to each song, aria, duet, or the overture. Um, because that was the form. So please don't be shy. We love to hear it. Uh, there are no artists who do not like applause. Okay, now this is a funny opera, so it's called uh, Opera Buffa. Buffa means funny. Buffo or Buffa. There was opera seria in the, uh, in the 18th century that was used about mythical figures, Roman conquerors, uh, Greek gods, etc. Um, but, but there was opera, opera buffa as well. But the opera buffa kept going through the first, at least the first half of the um, 19th century. But opera seria died away and became melodrama. Melodrama, of course, is what you know from Verdi. It was rare for anybody to die on the stage in opera buffa, about, in, no, unheard of, in opera buffa, nobody dies. In opera seria, they generally did not like seeing somebody die on the stage, so they would figure out a way that even if it was a serious opera, like Orpheus and Eurydice, Orpheus and Eurydice don't die, they get united at the end. Well, you know that's against the myth, but that was the style. <laughs> By the 19th century, that's going to change gradually, and melodrama, somebody has to die. <laughs> Pretty amazing. Um, just a little less than uh, 10 years after, um, after the, its premiere. Rosina, the main character, is not a soprano, that's a very high uh, voice. She is a mezzo-soprano, she's a middle soprano. Her voice is not that high. Now, for almost a century and a half, the tradition came to give to very high voices. So when I was a little boy and I was going to the opera the first time, they were all still very high sopranos. Um, and then the new um, historical critical uh, editions of musicology came in with a massive force for Rossini and they redefined everything. They said, this should not be sung by a high voice. It was written for a low voice, and that is true. So it has come down, it has come down to the mezzo-soprano. You will have heard perhaps great mezzo-sopranos, like Marilyn Horn, like Ter Teresa Berganza, uh, like Giulietto Simonato, who were low voices, and they were the great Rosinas as the mezzo-soprano re-emerged as the leading character. Um, and the, uh, the other character, Berta, she has one song to sing. She's meant to be a higher voice, and so she is. Uh, the uh, one person who does not have to sing beautifully is Dr. Bartolo. He's, because he's complaining and grumbling all the time, um, he's given the basso buffo role. Now, why does the basso buffo not have to sing beautifully? I don't know, but that got going in the 18th century. His job is to sing very fast and to sing words at a clip that is something like rap today. You cannot follow it, it is so fast, but that's the art, and I will show you one of those examples um, as we go along. Uh, Rossini uh, became famous, quickly he went to Vienna, he wanted to meet Beethoven, who of course was the god of the time, if not for all times. He was brought to Beethoven, who was deaf by that time, and uh, an Italian man brought him there, and Beethoven, Compliment, and he said, "Yes, I've seen the Bob's Phil. It's a very good opera." <laughs> okay, that's the first part. So. Uh, as, you, as you know, we have exposition, development, reprise, or recapitulation. So that's a big A, B, A form. Now remember that, A, B, A, B, A, because you're going to hear it over and over, not just in the overture, but in many of the arias. Now, that is the first part of A, and I told you it had three parts. So now it has a second part. Thank you. 
repeat itself. That's a little type of development. So you, here, we, here we go again. That's the sort of development. And then we get the second theme, which is the lyrical, contrasting theme. Rossini very often gives it to woodwind instruments, the French horn. And then something important happens. The third part of the exposition. So we've had the first, right? Then we've had the little development section, so on. And now we have the third part. Now, the third part is Rossini's invention. Here comes the Rossini crescendo. It's called the Rossini crescendo until this day. And it was a technique that he used over and over and over again. Why? Because he found that the public liked it. And Rossini was a businessman. The public liked it, he liked it. So it has, uh, it repeats itself on, with getting louder and louder and louder like boiling water. It usually has a, uh, a form where you can identify something twice and then three times. Let's follow it. Here's an idea, the beginning of the receipt. Oops. One, this is the first time that you hear that phrase. Here it is again, second time. Right. Now here's the new one. This is the first time. Second time. Now, when he comes back, we're going to hear all of those things again. <coughs> what will happen is that the recitative will push the story forward. That's where you follow what's going on. And then you'll have a more static moment where there is a reflection of what... So this is something that the, the, the recitative has been described as pulling the trigger of the gun and then pushing everything forward and then a gun goes off. It's a happy aria, a sad aria. A uh, happy duet, a love duet, a hate duet, you know, there's all sorts of things. The, ex the uh, difference being that Rossini, unlike anybody else in this opera, actually continues the action without the recitative with the orchestra. It is an action packed opera, it does not stop. So you recognize. Now, when I came in, uh, you were listening to Maria Callas. When she sing, comes in, Rosina will sing slowly, which she's doing now, and then she will sing fast. That's not as fast as she can. She'll go faster. Okay, her aria is finished, and then you're going to keep another highlight is the famous. La Calumnia, the aria about slander and calumny by the very comic Don Basilio. Drops, just little drops of rain starting before the storm. 
Rossini became a master of this and he left the pattern and the model for the rest of the century very to would write storms and they would be based on Rossini storms. Storms are very popular also because of because Beethoven had by now written the Pastoral Symphony, which of course has the most famous storm in the symphony. So you hear this, the rain accumulates. Oh, 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 oh,
That's a Rolls Royce. Yeah. A car. Oh, there's a lot of policemen here. Oh, yeah, over there. Over there. That's everywhere. 